Hello and welcome to another episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton and I get to be here today with Kelly Yance, who is a pastor, a wife, a mom of four, and an author in South Carolina. Um, we're going to be talking, this is our first, other than um, discussing Alana's Christian fiction, I think this is our very first Christian fiction author interview. So welcome to the podcast, Kelly, for a first. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, well, we're excited to have you. Um, so we always start out our interviews with a just for fun question. So, okay. to, so I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite prayer closet? Where is it that you go to feel closest to God? And it could be something common, like an actual room or a favorite chair or something totally off the wall. So I know a lot of moms will probably identify with this. Um, it's my my bathroom. I take baths um, every night. And at first I started doing it as more of like, I'm just going to relax and kind of get away from the kids for just a little bit and have like quiet time. And Or just praying, whatever it is, I just, I, I dedicate that time. Even if we're out somewhere and I get home late, like if it's midnight, I'll still like, that's my 30 minutes and I, I don't trade it for anything. That's good. And I, it's so important to have something that you already do as a habit. It's just nice to, to tag prayer to one of those. That's just like one of the easiest ways to make it happen. Absolutely. So another recent, just for fun, and I already know the answer to this because I, read your bio and you mentioned it, but coffee or tea, what's your thing? Oh my goodness. Um, lately I've drank a lot of coffee, but really I'm a teapot. I've had tea forever. Like as a toddler in my bottle, um, I had like <laughs> cups of tea. <laughs> my, my grandmother is British. So she introduced it to me very, very, very early, probably earlier than I should have had it, but I, I love it. I probably have like two to three cups of tea a day. It's almost like water for other people. <laughs> So is it, you mentioned English breakfast, is that your specific tea that you'll drink or will you not drink anything else? Or is that just kind of what you commonly have? Um, I'll trade it, like trade it out every now and again and kind of like change things up and have like a cinnamon tea or something kind of funky, like a fruit tea. But like, I, I love my English breakfast tea. It's just so warming and calming. <laughs> do you drink your tea with milk or is it just straight tea? I do. I do a spoonful of honey and a little bit of milk. All right. That sounds good. Is that Brit Is that the British way to drink tea with milk and sugar or milk and honey? I think they typically do milk and sugar. I changed out the sugar for honey pretty recently because I was trying to convince myself that I was being more healthy by right. doing that. Maybe it's more healthy. Maybe it's not, but <laughs> hey, it comes from bees and God made bees, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> sounds, sounds logical. All right. Well, this is just for fun part two. So I thought about this. Whenever I read Alana's books, I know her pretty well. So I know a lot of things about her. But when I'm reading her fiction, I like to like try to figure out if I know something new about her. Like one of her books, I learned that she had played violin because the description of the violin playing, I thought she had to have played the violin. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions because I don't know all these things about you um, based on your book which is, by the way, I don't think we mentioned that um, it's called The Thing About Mustard Seeds. And um, I'm going to ask, and you tell me if I'm right or wrong, based on okay. reading your novel. Okay. So do you play piano or have you played piano? I started learning how to play piano. Um, I actually inherited a piano from a great aunt who passed away. And I, I really didn't just want it like sitting in my house. I wanted to start playing with it and see if I could learn how to do it. So I can't actually read music. I actually learned the chords um, similar to what Rosalind did in the story. Okay. So very, like very similar, actually, like starting with like middle C and going from there. So it just similar. seemed very authentic when I was reading that about how she was learning. Rosalind is, for those that haven't read the book, she's the main, one of the main characters. And as she's learning to play these chords, I just thought you had to have done this before. Either you're a piano teacher or you've learned to play piano. So that's cool. All right. So ding, ding. The second one is, have you personally known someone with dementia or even to go a step further, been a caretaker in some capacity? 
Um, yeah, good question. So my, my father actually, he had um, dementia, which eventually turned to Alzheimer's. And for like the past five years, my sister and I had been taking care of him. Um, kind of interesting story with that. We didn't really know him growing up. Um, we visited maybe like once every two years and like had kind of like a week with him. But when his wife passed away, we um, we didn't want him to like kind of just sit in his home in Tennessee and wither away. So we brought him down to South Carolina and we just took him in. And it was it was an interesting time, but it was in like a lot of like kind of getting to know him, but getting to know him in kind of a different state than what you would conventionally get to know your dad, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So um, yeah, a lot of a lot of the like the nuances throughout the story where like it kind of progressed slowly, or you may notice like a few things here and there, even as far as like some of the more paranoid stages um, that you see like in chapter three with, with somebody that Rosalind's taking care of. Um, we, we experienced a lot of that firsthand. Yeah. My mom passed away 11 years ago and she had, she developed dementia very early on. Hers was I think she, she had actually a combination of things when they found out exactly what it was, but it was Alzheimer's and Lewy body dementia. And um, yeah, my grandfather had it. So it's very, that hit home for me and was very, again, very authentically uh, presented. I've read books where it's not authentically presented and this, just the nuances of, of what happened during that time. Um, I thought maybe you had been in that position, in that situation. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I, I also know the answer to this, but reading the book, have you been in ministry in some capacity? Because I just loved the church dynamics. It was just really fun to read and just to see kind of what the pastor goes through. And so just for our listeners, have you been in ministry in some capacity? I have, um, actually for like the past seven years and it was kind of a slow entry into ministry. It started mainly with my, my husband taking on a position as an assistant um, kids minister. And then I just kind of joined him and started working with him like on Sundays. And I was, um, when I grew up, I grew up Episcopalian and I was always like, I'm a Christian. Like I, I always associated with, with being a Christian, but I never really knew what that meant until I started working with him in ministry because he just had this like burning fire for the Lord and like his heart was just in it. And the more that I worked alongside him and the more that I just started going to like, like the church that he was going to, I, I just grew in my faith and I was like, I've, I've got to do it. Like whatever capacity that I can, like whatever talents that I have, whatever, whatever gifts I have, I have to use them in ministry. It was just one of those things where like there was no negotiation. I had to jump in full, full fledged. So definitely. That's great. Well, I just, um, yeah. We will let's let's jump into some of the book now. I don't want to do any spoilers because, um, and I I don't think I have any in here. If you catch me, then you know, kind of give me the wink or something to let me know that I, okay. <laughs> we need to move on. But um, there, let's see. So there's there's one thing that I really thought was a great theme, and Rosling, who is one of the main characters, is talking with another main character, and so she she's not all in and she doesn't even really know if she believes in God or if she believes in God in the, the Bible sense of God. And, and so, especially when some bad things happen to people she cares about, she sees these bad things happening and questions how a loving God could allow that to happen. And I think that's such a common sentiment. And especially today when we're just in this, you know, this crazy world of so much darkness, so much pain, so much difficulty. Um, and I know there are people questioning that. So what would you, uh, you had a re some really good dialogue in your book that addressed some of this. And, you know, so, um, so yeah, what would you say to someone who feels like this character in your book, other than read the book and see kind of how <laughs> it turns out? <laughs> Yeah, I, I've actually with my with my own kids, I've had a couple of conversations very similar to the one that um, Gentry had with Rosling, and it's um, very much like along the lines of um, looking at the world that we're in and kind of like drawing it back to like our purpose for being here. We're not here to have like this perfect life, because um, sometimes I mean when when things are 
wonderfully easy for us. It's almost like our relationship with God can even kind of fly under the radar. Yeah. But the way that um, Gentry like put it with Rosalind is that um, if, if I told my kids to love me every single day, at the end of the day, like would I really understand the root of their love and how much they love me? Or is it more authentic when they're coming to me and telling me on their own that they love me? And similar to our relationship with God, we, we all have to make that decision. We all have to kind of come to that on our own. And the purpose like of us being here is not so that we can go through like this carefree life. Like there's going to be trials. It even says like in scripture, we are going to have trials. We are going to see hard times. But at the end of the day, like God loves us. He weeps with us. He wants to make all things good for those who love him. And I think that that's just like, that's something that we should try to hang our hats on every day and remember that whatever we face here, like there is going to be a day that there's no more crying, no more mourning, no more pain. And really like our only job here in this life is just to decide, like, do we love God? Do we want to be rooted in faith? Do we want to be connected to Jesus and grow to be more like him? And I think when we take away the responsibility of having to like walk ourselves through all of these terrible things that are happening and just like put the responsibility and the onus back on ourselves to just like do that one simple thing, just love Jesus. I think it, it takes a lot of that pressure off because I think a lot of the times we we're sitting here thinking that we need to solve the world's problems. Yeah. Or, or explain everything when exactly. there's so much that's not explainable. You know, I think the temptation is, to say, well, God, you know, if you are a Christian and you do have that worldview to say, oh, well, God's doing this because blah, 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 you know, or God's allowing this to happen. So this other good thing can happen. And it's not always a one for one thing. Sometimes there's just stuff we don't understand and we couldn't, we couldn't possibly fathom and we couldn't possibly explain away. And I think there's comfort in not feeling like we have to explain for God sometimes whether we're on the side of questioning or whether we're on the side of counseling someone, you know, because not, you know, someone that, that doesn't believe or that doesn't understand. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, I, I like that theme in the book about just seeing her development, seeing her gra grappling with those questions and kind of navigating her faith or lack of faith. Absolutely. Another theme that I really, that, that really runs heavily through the book, especially as we get toward the end was forgiveness. Many characters, many of the characters had some serious forgiveness issues throughout the book that they had to, to struggle with. Is that something that you personally, does that have a personal meaning for you in your own life? And, um, yeah. Yeah, it did. Um, the funny thing is like living with unforgiveness, I think like the most egregious kind of unforgiveness is the kind that we don't know that we have. So mm -hmm. I can tell myself every day, like, I don't have any grudges. I'm not, I'm not holding any grudges against anybody. I'm, you know, I'm doing it right. But like, there's like those little nooks and crannies of our brain where like, maybe we haven't like fully forgive, forgive, forgiven someone. Um, and like kind of drawing back to like my dad and, and thinking of like growing up and, and like the, just not seeing him and then taking on the responsibility of, you know, caretaking for him during like one of the roughest points of his life. There were like days where I was probably just going through the motions and doing the good things because the good things were what you were supposed to do. The good things are, you know, I, I wanted to be good and I wanted to do what needed to be done for him to keep him healthy and safe. But then once he passed away, I realized all of these things that were just kind of left unsaid. And I realized all of these little like tiny, tiny bits of unforgiveness that I had in my heart. And I had to address those. I had to really like dive into those and get to a point where not only could I forgive him, but I could also forgive myself for not saying the things that needed to be said. So mm -hmm. a little bit of kind of dual forgiveness, but yeah. <laughs> Wow. No. And that is, that's a, that's a really good point because I, I know with my own personality, I don't like conflict. I would so much rather just let it be water under the bridge and stuff it and, and not deal with it. And, 
but it doesn't go away. It doesn't. And I think there probably are things pretty consistently that I, you know, someone like me needs to, to do some reflection and even prayer about God, draw out any unforgiveness because it, it's damaging. And I think that the hidden unforgiveness is more damaging than the stuff that you know is out there, you know, that you wear on your sleeve because it can fester and just hold you back. But I like what you said about forgiving yourself for not saying those things. Cause I could definitely see myself being in a position of like realizing I didn't say that when it needed to be said because I, I wanted to prevent conflict or whatever did, or didn't yeah. even know about it. Definitely. Yeah. What advice would you give to someone who right now might be aware of unforgiveness, but is bound by it and doesn't know what the next step might be? I, um, I had to think about this one a lot too, as I was writing to make sure that like what I was writing was authentic. I would say we have to do a self-assessment and not just a self-assessment of what do I think of me, but more of a self-assessment of what does Christ think about me? What does he, what does he see in me? What does he love about me? Like where are the areas that I have not given my heart over to him that he's still chasing and still seeking? Because I think the more we kind of get into alignment of the fact that God loves us and that we are his creation, the closer we can get to like really reconciling with the fact that the death and resurrection was about us. And it was about us holistically. It was about his love for us. And once we can like really fine tune and just kind of like agree, like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm so damaged and I'm so broken. And my, my goodness, like he still wants me. Mm -hmm. It's a lot easier. It's a lot easier for us to get to the point where we can start to have that forgiveness with other people. Because like looking at, especially like Gentry's mom and dad and Rosalind's mom and dad, um, there, like, there's a whole lot there that just needs to be like unraveled and forgiven. But both of them had to get to a point where they really understood who they were to Christ before they could do that. Yeah, no, that was, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you could choose one takeaway, like if there was one thing that you had sewn into this book, hoping that people would take away, would, would there be one, do you have like one main thing that you would love for someone to take away from this book after reading it? Yes. I think that the one takeaway that I would want people to have is that we don't know the inner workings of every person. We don't know what their history is, what caused them to be the way that they are, what caused them to have the mindset that they have. Um, we can't always understand people, but we can understand that Christ loves us and that he loves those people. And if we can get to the heart of that, then we can maybe start to have the conversations that get us closer to his people. I love that because there's one character in particular that really displays that someone who's a little hardened on the outside, that's abrasive and not very lovable or likable. And you begin to, as that backstory is revealed, you begin to have this compassion and that person is transformed because people don't give up on her. So I, yeah. I think that's kind of, that was, I love that part also. Um, and I did take that away for sure. That's not the one that I was going to, I had two and I, for some reason I can't think of the second one, but the one that, the one that I just kept thinking about as I was reading the book was our beginnings are not like where we, even where we are now are not the end of where God is taking us. And so someone's beginnings um, don't define their ending. The, the rough beginning doesn't mean that there's never going to, that that isn't even going to be used for God's good in yeah, the long term. That. And I just think of that, even with my kids, I mean, there are so many things that I do and I think, am I totally messing them up <laughs> and, oh. <laughs> and just things that I do. And I just think, you know what, God's plan for them, God's, God's working in their life is so sovereign that even my mistakes, not that I'm going to strive to be, to make mistakes or become a lazy parent or, you know, not want to be the very best I can for them. But 
um, even the mistakes that they make that are outside of my control, despite my best efforts, all of those things are building blocks. And as, and, and that prayer, praying for them and just is, is so important because God has this, you know, amazing plans for them and they, they aren't defined by the rough beginnings or the messy middle or anything else. And yeah, so I think I, I like seeing the, the development of the characters and the fact that we get to see these characters as kids, we get to see them as adults and we get to see them on these journeys, even as adults growing. Yeah. That's good stuff right there. Yeah. So, and I can't remember the second one. There was a second one and I think it was like, oh, well, and I, th I think it was just generally the idea of just the title of the book, the thing about mustard seeds and just that, um, you know, a mustard seed of faith um, can grow and, and that just the importance of in the people that we love that aren't saved, that we would love to see come to know God, that we'd love to see live these, you know, full lives, um, full spiritual lives that, that we can't give up on that either, because you never know what mustard seed of faith is there that they've taken. And we can't, we also can't um, minimize, sometimes we'll have an impact on someone without even knowing it. And you just never know what that's going to end up doing later on down the line, even if you don't see immediate fruit. So that was another one was sometimes the mustard seed takes decades to grow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. Awesome. Yeah. Well, what, um, where can people connect with you online and find your books? Because this isn't your only book. So I am on Instagram and Facebook as author Kelly Sullivan Yance, and I also have a website. Um, it is bayoulibertybooks-kellyyance.com. All right. We'll include that in the show notes too, so people can click on that and get directly to you. Can they get your books through that website? Um, yep. I've got it linked on there. Um, they're all available on amazon.com as well. Right. That's, yeah, that's where I've seen them too. All right. Well, how can we pray for you today, Kelly? Um, I, the newest journey in ministry for my husband and I is we are starting up a young adult ministry on Monday nights. And so far it's gone well. We've had um, a lot of really good dialogue and conversations, but I would just love the prayer that, um, that, you know, people keep joining us and like wherever hearts need to grow that like they they find a spot to do it in our ministry and and that maybe we can reach people that we otherwise wouldn't have reached all right well let's um let's pray all right god we just thank you for this time together thank you so much for um just the messages the the lessons from this book that we were able to talk about and Lord, we just thank you for Kelly being here and sharing her heart and her passion. We just lift her up to you, God. We just pray for her and for her husband that you would provide them with everything that they need. Just equip them with um, all the tools that they need to shepherd this group of young adults. We thank you that it's something you've put on their heart, that they have a group that's meeting. And we just pray that you would take it from there, Lord. Show them the next steps. Um, we just pray that you would prepare the hearts of these young adults to be part of this group, that you would bind them together. Just give them a safe place there where they can feel they belong, where they can um, talk about their questions and um, just really have love and uh, ministry poured into them by Kelly and her husband. We just pray for their entire family, Lord, that you would strengthen their marriage, for their children, for their church. And um, we just pray for Kelly's ministry through writing, that you would open doors for her, Lord, that you would just allow her stories um, to get out to more people, that you would open doors and um, just allow your kingdom to grow through people reading these books and thinking about things that, that they might not have even known they needed to think about, and, and that people that don't know you would read her books for enjoyment and come away with just spiritual food for their souls and, and a closer relationship to you or one step closer to, to getting to know you. Um, just thank you for this time, Lord. And we just pray that you would bless it and just bless Kelly and her family and her ministry in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.